Welcome back to my animal education series. Today I'm here at the Columbus Zoo and I'm actually by myself. I don't even have my dad here with me, which is kind of weird walking around the zoo by myself. Now this time might not seem like a super important topic to people who just are going to the zoo, look at the animals and kind of move on from the enclosure. But what I found my dad and I doing is that when we go to a zoo, we spend a lot more time looking at the enclosure itself than the actual animal in the enclosure. Like it could be like this beautiful tiger and just sitting there in front of the glass, but my dad and I are looking over the tiger and at the enclosure and what the enclosure has to offer the animal. Because no matter how beautiful an animal is, if the enclosure isn't set up properly for the animal, the animal is not happy and is not enjoying itself. But I thought I'd show you guys some of the things I look for when I go to a zoo that really kind of shows off that zoos have done the research and really want to benefit the animal and animal's well-being. But without further ado, let's get started on this video. So a really cool thing that a lot of zoos do is they have this thing called a reverse day cycle. So what basically that means is during the nighttime for us, they turn on all the lights in the nocturnal building, so it seems like day to them, and then they turn off all the lights during the day when we're here, so when we're wide and awake, they are as well. So, again, Columbus is not the only one that does that. A lot of zoos do that. This is the best way to get a view of nocturnal animals. Right behind us here, we have some tree kangaroos. I don't know how well it's gonna show up, but they're right about there. These animals are super cool, because they're not very, a uh, well-known animal, and I know some big fan of them. They just look really neat. Another really awesome area here at the Columbus Zoo specifically is that they have manatees, which isn't an uh, animal at a whole lot of zoos. So the enclosure here, another one of my little turning transitions, back here. So they have all sorts of animals here that are eventually rehabilitated, which is, I think is really awesome. So they have sea turtles, they have manatees here, they have stingrays that they have, and this is how they have this entire area set up. Let me just like turn the camera around. Like, it looks like I'm in a mangrove forest and it looks super cool. So you walk in into this little mangrove area here. Then you have this big, nice long walk area. And you can see how it just looks super natural. We got a turtle here. Another really good enclosure here at the Columbus Zoo is the beaver enclosure. I keep doing those spin transition things, but it's the best thing to come up on the top of my head. But the beaver enclosure, the beaver is actually a pretty rare animal to find in a zoo because not a whole lot of zoos have them. I'm not exactly sure why, why that is. I know for the moose because it's very difficult to keep up, uh, keep up with and take care of, which I knew the Columbus Zoo does have moose as well, which is also really neat. I don't think I got any footage there because there's a lot of people, but I have a picture which I'll put up on the screen now. But uh, back to the beavers. This enclosure is awesome. We got this nice little water area here. I'm gonna flip the camera and kind of show you guys some details. So we have this awesome, really deep water area here that just extends these two panels that people get to view. And then they got a stream that goes all the way down to the other little pond there. They got tons of branches, logs, and sticks and everything, which is really difficult to see with all the dirty glass. Another enclosure I would really like to touch on is the North American River Otter, which is right back here. So the river otter lives in North American woodlands and in rivers, streams, things like that. And they did a really good job implementing that here. So there's plenty of woods and logs and stumps for them to hide on and climb in. And they got a nice pond in the stream over there. They have this glass here with the little dots on it, which actually helps birds see the glass so they, do, they don't hit it. But you can see up there, the little water feature. And they have tons of space to hide. They're over there hiding in a log. That's why everyone else is over there. I'm over here because there's like no people. This is a good example of a large enclosure for a large animal. The Columbus Zoo here has a 1.32 acre enclosure for their polar bears. And bears in general typically have large enclosures at zoos to give them plenty of space to walk around and explore. Polar bears and grizzly bears specifically have larger water features as they spend more time in the water. And with bears, they have to have enrichment on both the land and the water area. Here we can see a couple of plastic toys, and in the water there are fish for them to interact with and to help them cool down in the heat. One thing many zoos do is have multi-species enclosures. This allows different species of animals to interact with other species, and that provides further enrichment for each animal. 
Another thing that the Columbus Zoo does that I like seeing at a lot of zoos is the use of invisible fencing. Invisible fencing is when the fence or the barrier of between enclosures is hidden from the viewer, which makes it look like all one big enclosure. I do also want to specify that even though I am at the Columbus Zoo today, this is not the only zoo that does this. All major zoos do this and implementing all those awesome things into the enclosure so that the animals have the best possible lives. So this enclosure is a perfect example of using natural adaptations and natural environment and implementing them into the enclosure. So here we have some Marcoris, which is probably pronounced wrong. I'm not even going to say I know how to pronounce it properly. Live on cliff faces and cliff dwellings and things like that. So here in the enclosure, you can see that they implemented plenty of rock structures for these guys to climb. The next enclosure up here is the Sloth Bear. Sorry for the really bad lighting, but it has this awesome decorated uh, canopy here. But the Sloth Bear is an Asiatic species of bear that likes to climb, and also they feed on termites. So you can definitely see all those factors here. All the trees and stuff in the background there. And if you look down there, they have a nice big log that they can use for digging. And you can tell it definitely has a lot of use out of it. If I flip the camera around here, you can see all of the many opportunities for them to climb. They have access to all down here. They have this tree here, this tree here, all of those trees back there. The tree that the one bear is currently sleeping in right now. And then there's the log I was talking about that definitely has a lot of use out of it. You can see the bark is just everywhere. So some really neat things you can first tell off at uh, this water monitor enclosure is water. Water, matter water monitors are a semi-aquatic species of monitor and they're also very closely related to the Komodo dragon. So with them being semi-aquatic, they want to have a good amount of water to land area. And as we can see here, about 50% of the ground space is used for water and the other 50% is used for the land. I'm gonna turn the camera around real quick. And when water monitors are younger, they like to climb. So we have plenty of climbing opportunity here. So they are definitely putting branches and everything in here that this water monitor will use and kind of help exercise. These branches and stuff and exercise is really good for them. There's a lot of animals in captivity that aren't doing anything, have a lot of joint problems because their legs aren't being properly exercised. So seeing this kind of stuff here and understanding that they like water and to climb is very important and a good thing to look for. Alrighty, so the last enclosure that I wanted to talk about today was the Aldabra tortoise enclosure. So you may think that this looks really simple, but it has some very important characteristics to it that really help the tortoises out. So, Let's go over here a little bit. You can know that there's definitely elevation change. And then for the pond, you have to go down in it and climb yourself back out of it. That is very important for tortoises because for uh, these large species of tortoise, like um, Aldabra, Sulcatas, etc., they have a lot of joint problems as they grow up. For having a lot of flat area, their knees don't properly develop, don't get the proper uh, exercise. So it's basically like you never climbing anything in your entire life and then being expected to climb a flight of stairs. It's not exactly that simple. And when their knees aren't properly exercised, it's not very good for them and it declines their health significantly. Thank you guys so much for watching this week's video. Don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below. Subscribe to my channel. As always, I'll see you next week.